At the turn of the 20th century, Russia was ruled by the House of Romanov, a dynasty that ruled Russia for over 400 years. Social change in the early years of the 20th century was turbulent in Russia. So turbulent, it brought down this czarist autocratic government. Russia's involvement in World War I led to revolution. Armed with antiquated rifles, troops didn't receive the supplies they needed to face a well-organized enemy with new industrialized weapons. The involvement in World War I decimated the Russian army, and the soldiers began to revolt against their commanders. Before we look at the art movement born out of revolution, let's look at its precedents. In 1915, and possibly as early as 1913, Casimir Malevich pioneered a completely abstract style he called suprematism. It was an art movement that rejected the imitation of natural shapes in favor of fundamental geometric forms. As he put it, he wanted to free art from the burden of the object in order to reach a desert in which nothing can be perceived but feeling. A black square on a white background. There are four canvases that exist. The first, they believe, was painted in 1913. It remains the most radical symbol of modern art. Malevich created a non-objective world, and unless we dismiss it completely, the only way we can respond to it is on an instinctive level. Malevich was convinced that outside of the realm of things, there lay an altogether different order of experience that showed itself as non-objective feeling. He described this alternative order in an equation. Black square equals feelings. White ground, the void beyond this feeling. His art became pure geometry. He opposed materialism, claiming that the only true reality is in the spiritual life. Squares, rectangles, triangles, lines, and circles in space. Each possess a free-floating quality, imbued with spiritual values. Paintings of a world less focused on materiality, consumption, and decadence, as the medium's purpose had originated. This photo documents his exhibition, 0 0.10 installation, the last futurist exhibition, Petrograd, December 1915. It not only adds context, but also notice the chair for a sense of scale to his work. He uses the traditional illusion of depth with one object overlapping another, but each still a flat geometric shape. Inspired by cubism and futurism in Europe, Malevich believed this feeling was best expressed through abstract geometric form. Malevich's suprematism stands at the heart of a transformation in architecture, furniture, typography, and graphic design across much of Europe. By the end of World War I, the art scene had changed forever. Shell-shocked by the experience of war, the artist community, by and large, saw this as an exciting new time, a time when the corrupt old order would end and a new, fair society would take its place. Many devoted their lives to propaganda for a new Russian communist society. World War I did not cause the Russian Revolution, but it so traumatized Russian society and the Russian army that it made the revolution possible. The casualties, horrendous loss of life, disease, mutinies, the czarist incompetence allowed the revolutionary powers to organize the populations in the cities of Russia. The Mensheviks, a moderate Marxist socialist party, were first to organize a government. Its mistake, though, was to try and continue Russia's participation in World War I. October 1917, Vladimir Lenin, a Bolshevik, a radical Marxist socialist, saw his opportunity. He rallied the masses on a slogan, peace, land, bread, and successfully overthrew the moderate Mensheviks. It was the Soviet Revolution and the beginning of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, known as the USSR. Lenin's goal was to radically change society, eliminate the upper and middle classes politically by terror, and raise the worker class, the proletariat, to a leadership role in society. In this, he was following the Marxist philosophy to its logical conclusion. Marx wrote, the means of production would be owned by the people. When the worker parties, or Marxist parties, took control, there was a rejection of the arts for the wealthier middle class in favor of art as utility for the working class. 
while Malevich argued that art was spiritual and needed to be separate from the needs of society. This new movement was political, inspired by the aesthetics of suprematism, but its philosophical opposite. Suprematism inspired constructivism. Now Google Russian constructivism, and this is the visual language. Some of the work is new here, and some are original works. Constructivism was a geometric abstract art movement initially influenced by suprematism. After the Russian Revolution, they tried to create a new society by applying geometric design principles to all areas of life. They conducted intensive propaganda campaigns and constructed art to serve the people and the Socialist Party. One of the leading constructivists, L. Lizitsky, was heavily influenced by Malevich's geometric abstraction, but he applied the mathematical structure of architecture to his paintings. He called his abstract paintings crowns, which in Russian stands for towards a new art. Now contrast Malevich's suprematist painting, Airplane Flying, in 1915 to Elizitsky's crown from 1919. Elizitsky added a third dimension to Malevich's suprematism. Elements both recede backward and project forward from the picture plane. On the left is a crown from 1922. Geometric solids float in a state of equilibrium. Working in tempera, varnish, and pencil on canvas, Elizitsky explored color and line and materiality in his crowns. On the right is Prown G7 from 1923. This is a formal exploration of transparency, opacity, and materiality. In keeping with his socialist ideology, Elizitsky believed his ideas needed to reach out to a mass audience. So he began to create propaganda posters and lithographic prints for his Bolshevik party. This lithograph is titled Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge, 1919. The Bolshevik army emblem, a red wedge, slashes diagonally into a white sphere. The white circle represents the old order. The slogan's four words are placed strategically to reinforce the dynamic movement. Graphic elements become political symbols. Graphics were designed for an illiterate public, so geometric visuals were intended to replace text as the main form of communication. Billboards similar to this visual language were placed in public spaces, like this one. Abstract form, designed to be a rallying cry for the illiterate working class people. Along with propaganda, Elizitsky spread his ideas through book design. In 1923, Elizitsky collaborated with the leftist poet Vladimir Mayakovsky to create this 61-page book of 13 of Mayakovsky's poems. The book is titled For the Voice because it's meant to be read out loud. Elizitsky incorporated mixed fonts of various sizes and weights on a variety of different diagonals, verticals, and horizontals. Typography took on the formal qualities of his crowns, geometric shapes, floating in equilibrium. As he put it, Lezitsky illustrated Mayakovsky's poetry as a violin accompanies a piano. The poem Our March begins, beat your drums on the squares of the riots turned red with the blood of revolution. The title typography has the staccato cadences of a drum beat. On the verso, or left page, the red square signifies the blood-stained town squares. The recto, or right page, illustrates the soldiers marching and waving their scarlet and black flags. With this radical shift in book design, image was now meant to be read and typography was meant to be seen. Notice how Elizitsky's structural design incorporates die-cut index tabs so you can flip to a certain poem, indicated by a graphic element from the page. This spread is titled Order for the Army of the Arts. Art and word are intertwined in a layout that reflects rhythm and content. Every single element in this composition is from the typographic case of a letterpress print shop. The graphs and lines are appropriated for visual expressions. Sophisticated printing incorporates overlapping colors. It's a two-color publication printed in red and black ink. The Museum of Modern Art in New York has a beautifully designed website on the Russian avant-garde book I've posted the link in this week's Explore section. 
Elisitsky began to create editorial assignments that spread constructivist ideas throughout Europe. Along with internal propaganda, Elisitsky spread his ideas outwardly through editorial assignments. One trilingual journal is titled Vesht in Russian, Gegenstein in German, translated to mean article, and Object in French. The journal was developed to exchange ideas across borders and in three different languages. On the left is a cover from 1922, and like his prounds, letter forms were constructed out of geometric forms. Elisitsky makes use of a dynamic diagonal axis. A negative and positive letter form divide the diagonal plane, creating a transparent effect, giving the feeling of objects floating in space. On the right side is the title page. This multilingual publication was a meeting point for new creative ideas from different nations. Some of Malevich's ideas were published and articulated in articles written by the artist, as you see in the lower right corner. Elisitsky's new art was intended to reach far across the globe. Broom was a radical art and literary magazine. Initially printed in Europe, the intention was to introduce new avant-garde art to the U.S. Broom commissioned Elisitsky to create some of their cover designs. This is the cover for Volume 5, Number 4, along with Elisitsky's original sketch, dated 1923. Many of his original ideas made it into the final design, as you see here. He's retained the juxtaposition of the name, but he's carried that through with the numbers for a more symmetrical composition. Elisitsky collaborated with Dadaist Hans Arp to create The Isms of Art, published in 1924. It is a catalog of artists, attitudes, and movements. This critical publication documented the turbulent developments in the art world from 1914 to 1924. The table of contents is a two-column grid structure. This seminal publication includes the work of many artists from previous lectures, Picasso, Juan Gris, Hannah Hooch, Fernand Leger, and artists I will discuss, Theo van Duisburg and Lionel Feininger. Significant for its trilingual design in German, French, and English, it describes and elaborately illustrates the major art movements of the 20th century. Again, many from this and previous lectures, Cubism, Futurism, Mertz. Note the three vertical columns on each page create a grid structure. The bold rules separate German, French, and English texts. Here are two pages showing the diversity of the structured layout and graphics to illustrate the articles. Bold, sans-serif numbers link pictures to their copy points in the catalog copy. Elisitsky's abstract style of prounds and geometric poster designs were heavily criticized for, ironically, not being accessible to the masses. So in 1922, Elisitsky began to incorporate photomontage. This is the poster for a Russian exhibition of art in Zurich, 1929. This marked a return to representation from the pure abstract form that constructivism was founded on. This move towards realism continued, and in 1934, a doctrine of social realism prohibited abstract art and design under the rule of Joseph Stalin, or Stalinism. Here's the original photomontage prep work on the right. The male-female illustration looking out of the frame illustrated the Soviet youth gazing into the future. That subject matter typifies much of constructivist photomontage. In addition to the promotional materials, Elisitsky designed the actual Russian exhibition seen as the high contrast image running diagonal across the poster. He continued to work in exhibition design and created this exhibit for the Soviet publishing industry. The image on the left is from the Pavilion of the Soviet Union at the Presse exhibition in Cologne, Germany in 1928. It shows three huge belts in constant motion turning on steel drums and covered with propaganda promoting the Soviet Union. The color photo on the right is a reproduction of the central red star from the exhibit. Three-dimensional prowns, or geometric shapes, float above and inside the star. Typographic forms encircle the installation, creating a larger-than-life quality to the idea. Probably the most copied designer in the history of design. When I say Russian propaganda poster, it's Alexander Rachinko's style that comes to mind. As a constructivist and a Bolshevik, he renounced art for art's sake, and he called on the artist to stop producing useless things and instead communicate to the masses. 
He believed the duty of the artist as a citizen of the community is to help create a new life. This is a self-portrait of Rodchenko with a leftist magazine masthead reflected in his glasses. The leftist opposition created this publication, Neuvi Left, to spread their ideas. Neuvi, translated, means new. Left stands for the left front of the arts. So together, they stand for the new left front of the arts. At its core was the principle that the creation of a new society required the creation of new forms. Started by the activist poet Vladimir Mayakovsky, Neuvi Lef included many of the European avant-garde in the arts and literature. The magazine was supported by a group that called themselves the Bolsheviks of the Arts. Rodchenko designed all of its covers. He primarily used photomontage and symbolism. For example, the cover on the left has a plane with a decal on its side of the leftist publication. A writer's ink pen drops on a gorilla representing the old order of the arts. In addition to photomontage, covers were designed with wood and metal type, heavy wood lines, and printed with precise registration. Notice how perfect the black meets the red ink in the logo type. It continues the Soviet color palette of red and black on white symbolizing the revolution, the black of night, the red of blood spilled, and the white of Russian snow. Lilia Brick was the image of this worker's poster, a promotional piece for books and reading. In addition to the sale of books, workers' literacy was necessary to get the state-run economy going. Note the hand-painted Russian letter forms. Each block of copy, with particular attention paid to letter and line spacing, achieved a unified design. Rachinko was also a photojournalist, and he took many of his own images that he montaged as the dominant element in his designs. Lilia Brick was the image of the worker's poster. Pro Eto is a book written by Vladimir Mayakovsky in 1923. Mayakovsky won fame before the revolution for his experimental poetry and flamboyant behavior. The poems are about the trials of his love affair with Lilia Brick. The cover photo of Lilia Brick is among the most widely recognized images of Russian constructivism. Hand-lettered, Rachinko created new letter forms for this book cover. Image is married to word in the title as the letter forms are knocked out of the photo of Brick. In this detective series of Russian pulp fiction, the central idea was to reach a mass audience to spread Bolshevik ideals. It was anti-American, anti-capitalism, and pro-communist propaganda. Rachinko designed covers for the entire series of paperback books that were titled Mess Mend, or Mending the Mess of Capitalism, 1924. Mess Mend is a detective series by author Jim Dollar, a.k.a. Marietta Shaganyan. The photomontaged images captured the narrative of each book in the series, highlighting the main characters. Characters laid on top of what became the geometry of the Soviet aesthetic. Underneath the popularity of these magazines and books were revolutionaries seeking to create a utopian society through their craft. The creation of a new society required the creation of new forms. Revolutionary art required the active participation of the viewer, who would be transformed by the effect of interpreting the work. Victor Margolin describes the constructivist vision in his book, The Struggle for Utopia, Rachinko, Lazitsky, Maholy Naj, 1917 to 1946. The constructivist believed objects produced should both facilitate change in people, making them more ideally Soviet, as well as represent Soviet ideals through their materials and construction. With the goal to create a new Soviet citizen through art, Rachinko began to produce advertising and packaging, some dating back as early as 1922. Advertising was a way for constructivists to reach a mass audience through an acceptable medium with a desire to educate the audience. Here are two ads for biscuits. Mosselprom, the Moscow Association of Enterprises Processing Agro-Industrial Products, was a building in the center of Moscow, which housed the state-run food and cigarette factory. Rachinko translated the three-dimensional form of the architecture to a two-dimensional print ad for the company. All of this design was state-sponsored, created to sell products manufactured for state-run factories. 
Unlike capitalism, sales benefited the production workers, or the proletariat. It fueled the communist system. This is an example of package designs for cigarettes. They were ads promoting products of Mosselprom. Theories of constructivist design were applied to furniture, buildings, film titles, and even clothing. These sports clothes were designed by Rachinko's wife, Vervara Stepanova, in 1923. This photo shows students wearing the constructivist design for sportswear. This is a view of a worker's reading area designed by Alexander Rachinko called the Workers' Club. It was an exhibition at the International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts in Paris in 1925, referred to as a highly efficient recharge station to which workers might come for intellectual fun, like reading of Lenin-approved texts or a game of chess. The exhibit demonstrated to the world how the educated Soviet worker spent their leisure time. Through the design of space, reading became a public act. This exhibition was a display for the whole world to see, a performance of the new Soviet worker. The club embodied revolutionary ideology by reconceiving leisure time as an active and collective rather than a passive and solitary space. Rachinko designed the furniture to serve multiple functions aimed at educating the worker through the most up-to-date information technologies. The hinged communal table could be flat for work or inclined for reading and the playing surface of the chess table revolved to give the players access to their seats. The collapsible structure against the far wall combined a platform for a speaker, a blank screen for projected slogans and signs, and an expandable screen to display larger visual propaganda. In the struggle for utopia, Margolin concludes, these artists were not trying to create a revolutionary new kind of art, they were trying to create art that would facilitate a revolutionary new society. Unfortunately, harsh economic conditions meant most of these ideas were not executed for more than propaganda. In the end, the constructivists did not create a new Soviet society through the integration of art and life, but through their posters and editorial design and advertisements, they were able to shape a collective consciousness and along the way created an innovative style that has been emulated over the century and into the next. To style was a movement developed in the Netherlands around the same time as constructivism developed in the Soviet Union. It got its name from a publication. Its common aim was to find laws of equilibrium and harmony that would apply to life, society, and art. Imagery was characterized by primary colors, flat rectangular areas, and only straight, horizontal, and vertical lines. Piet Mondrian was a co-founder, and his underlying philosophy and theory was that he believed there are two aspects to human nature, active and passive, which he referred to as male and female. To express this visually, he used vertical and horizontal lines, and the lines would run in opposition, creating harmony and balance. He believed the spiritual and formal clarity, the expression of pure reality, comes from this equilibrium. Composition with large blue plane, red, black, yellow, and gray, 1921 not intended to tell something concrete, but to show the world ideal harmony. Along with the fundamental lines running contrary to one another, the theory also stated that the three principal colors are essentially pure color, yellow, blue, and red. According to Mondrian, they are the colors that form the universal harmony. Mondrian said of his work that it evolved out of the canvas and direct from the relationship and harmony of the lines. Here you see an unfinished canvas as Mondrian worked through his process. Composition with red, yellow, and blue, 1922. Mondrian gave his theory a name. It's called neoplasticism, the belief that art should not reproduce real objects but express the absolutes of life, vertical, horizontal lines, and primary colors. Art should express absolute color and equilibrium. In 1940, Mondrian moved to New York. Here's how one visitor described his New York studio. Everything was spotless white like a laboratory. In a light smock with his clean shaven face wearing his heavy glasses, Mondrian seemed more a scientist or a priest than an artist. 
The only relief to all the white was large map boards, rectangles in yellow, red, and blue, hung in asymmetric arrangements on the walls. Peering at me through his glasses, he noticed my glance and said, I've arranged these to make it more cheerful. New York had an effect on Mondrian's work. It became more energetic and almost mirrored the city's emotions. His painting, Broadway Boogie Woogie, from 1942-43, hangs in the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan. The piece is made up of a number of squares of bright color that leap from the canvas, then appear to shimmer, drawing the viewer into those neon lights. Mondrian lived out the remainder of his life committed to the vertical and horizontal theories of his youth. The other co-founder of De Stijl was Theo van Duisburg. He edited the journal De Stijl, from which the movement got its name. Van Duisburg believed that Dada could destroy the old order, then De Stijl could build a new order. He strongly believed that something as utilitarian as a tea kettle could elevate life. His aim was to bring art to the people in everyday life. Born Christian Emile Marie Cooper, he used Theo van Duisburg for his painting, architecture, and design, I.K. Bonset for his Dadaist poetry, and Aldo Comini for the anti-philosophical writings as an art critic. Composition 4 in three parts from 1917. In the early years, it's difficult to tell the work of Van Duisburg and Mondrian apart. However, Van Duisburg is still working with secondary and tertiary colors, like you see here. This is called The Cow, 1917. Again, we see rectilinear shapes on a horizontal and vertical axis. But a cow? Let's look at his process. Very different from Mondrian in this early stage, in that this is a reductive approach inspired by the medium of stained glass. Let me show you what I mean by reductive. First, he developed his sketch, capturing the shape and realistic stance of the beast. But then he began to simplify the shapes, lights and darks, and still define the animal. He lost the curvilinear line and replaced the line and shading with flat geometric shapes. Now, he begins to define the shapes with color and block them out further on the canvas. And voila, this is the final step. Only the horizontal and vertical axis exist. Even a cow is seen filtered through the intellectual philosophy of complete harmony. This is the first cover of 12 issues. The issues were published from 1917 to 1931. The lettering is by Vilmos Hussar and the image is by Theo van Duisburg. The logo is based on the making of elementary forms, something that was a central concept within Du Stijl. Compare the more abstract cover design illustration to The Digger on the right, a stained glass composition by Van Duisburg from the same year, 1917. Vilmos Hussar is known as the probable designer of the title letters, which are built in blocks above the logo. Applying the same principles and process, typography is reduced to rectilinear, horizontal, and vertical forms. In 1921, a significant event took place in the development of De Stijl. Van Duisburg met with his Eastern European counterpart, the Russian constructivist El Lizitsky, and the supremacist elements that influenced Lizitsky's prowns captivated Van Duisburg. He incorporated it into his spectrum of thought as seen in the cover on the right. The constructivist cover design is in marked contrast to the early covers. There's a conscious shift from woodcut logotype, a symmetrical centered composition, to the asymmetrical alignment that becomes a standard modernist type aesthetic and philosophy. Now, much of the work and design is documented in this book, The Essence of De Stijl and Graphic Design, one of a series of 14 books published by the German design school, the Bauhaus. We begin to see more crossover with ideas when the Russian constructivist El Lizitsky published a children's book that was highlighted and republished in De Stijl magazine by Van Duisburg. Titled A Tale of Two Squares from 1922, it was a fable about two squares, a black square and a red square. I'll read it to you. About two squares, El Lizitsky. El Lizitsky. To all, to all children, a supremacist story about two squares in six constructions. Berlin, Skyton, 1922. Don't read this book. Take, paper, fold, rods, color, blocks of wood, build. Here are two squares. From far away, flying towards the earth. See black chaos. 
crash, all scattered. And on the black was established red clearly. Thus it ends, further. Titled A Tale of Two Squares from 1922, a children's book about creating a new order. The book was a call to action to go out and build. Elizitsky saw the book as an instrument of change. Lizitsky presented radical rethinking of what a book was. He demonstrated a new way of organizing type and geometry in a narrative structure. Words were slanted, angled, bold-faced, yet they communicated the content. According to historians, Of Two Squares is among the most important publications in the history of the avant-garde in graphic design for its rethinking of narrative form on the printed page. Then the day came, 1924. Van Duisburg developed elementarism, which declared the diagonal to be a more dynamic compositional principle than horizontal and vertical construction. Committed to his theory of neoplasticism, Mondrian severed ties and refused to speak to Van Duisburg. They parted ways and never spoke again. Van Duisburg continued to paint and design architecture. This is a study and countercomposition from 1925. In his theoretical phase, Van Duisburg constructed planes in space, bringing the two-dimensionality of de Stijl to a three-dimensional structure. The phase can surely only be seen as a direct de Stijl response to Elisitsky's Prown style. Planes nebulously appear to float in space. Strasbourg, France, 1926. Van Duisburg, with artist Hans Arp and Sophie Tober, obtained the commission to refurbish the interior of a mid-18th century building to create Café Abet, a large restaurant with a cinema and dance halls. The room was overwhelmed by diverging diagonal lines passing from walls to ceiling. Finished in 1928, it is considered the last neoplastic architecture produced of true significance. What Van Duisburg created theoretically, and in interior designs, Garrett Rietveld realized in three dimensions. He was a member of the de Stijl movement who applied the principles to three-dimensional architecture and furniture. He designed the Schroeder House, a house that was the embodiment of the de Stijl movement. Here you see the Schroeder House, Utrecht, Holland, built in 1924. Planes in space. Here's another look at the balcony of the southwest wall. Note the straight horizontal and vertical lines, as well as the use of primary colors. A Mondrian in three dimensions. Its principles are clearly recognizable. A dynamic asymmetric arrangement, horizontal converging on vertical planes, and a pure red, yellow, blue, and gray palette with black horizontal and vertical lines. The south corner and a wider shot reveal it situated in the neighborhood. Not exactly urban planning. <laughs> the house looked so strange and out of place that the Schroeder children were mercilessly taunted and teased. It has a beautiful relationship between the exterior and the interior, a very open house. Spaces are manipulated with movable walls that swing out, pull across, and change the space relationships entirely to fit the needs. And Rietveld succeeded in making it that way by treating the walls as a three-dimensional composition of planes. Rietveld believed there was a beauty in industrial elements. For example, notice the use of industrial tubing to create the radiator in the dining room. He designed every bit of the furniture in the house. This is red and blue chair, 1918. His furniture was not a massive block in the room, but more linear and open with transparency. The simplicity of the chair meant it could be manufactured easily for mass production, fulfilling the objectives of bringing art to the people. It's more interesting to design furniture that is used by hundreds of thousands of people than to make a beautiful piece only used by one, he wrote. Elisitsky traveled around Europe presenting the concepts of constructivism and art for a new society. After hearing Elisitsky speak in 1920 about creating a new universal concept of art devoted to progress, the Polish painter and designer Henrik Berlowy began to bring mechanical elements to his art. In 1924, he published his theory on mechanofactura, which translates to mechanical reproduction. Mechanofactura was about fitting the art to the technical industrial process. It was a two-dimensional style of form which did not break out of the flatness of the picture plane. 
he applied these theories to his graphic design. In this exhibition poster for an auto show, he produced the design in the letterpress production shop. In 1924, along with two futurist poets, Berlowy opened an advertising agency in Warsaw called Reclama Mechano. He brought this new mechanical language to the masses through advertising. In 1925, one year after Van Duisburg introduced the diagonal, these brochure spreads became the design for Pluto's chocolate. Locked up forms with metal type are rotated in dynamic diagonal compositions. At a time when advertising was very illustrative, Berlowy only used typographic printing material as both expressive and textural form. Flat two-dimensional form, free from the illusion of three dimensions. He only worked with the mechanical, reproducible machined material to capture the spirit of a new age. In the country of Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic, Ladislav Suchner applied the same constructivist ideas to his design, which was geometric design, or geometry, creating form. Suchner applied simple geometry to everyday objects. His toy elephant, designed in 1930, is articulated by the use of geometric shapes. On the right is a prototype for children's blocks. The toy from 1943 is called Build a Town. This is a lovely example of a porcelain service based on the circle with a red geometric edge, 1929, and a tea service from Fireproof Glass, 1931. Ladislav Sudner was also a graphic designer and applied the same approach to his printed material. He created this cover design for the G.B. Shaw book, Getting Married, in 1933. Notice how Sutner uses geometric form, the bold red triangle, to bring two photographs together in a unified whole. The type placement follows the diagonal of the shape, overlapping and thus unifying the elements. De Stijl and constructivist ideas spread to the design work of this Hungarian constructivist, Laszlo Moholy Nagy. Theo van Duisburg had a great impact on Moholy Nagy, as seen here in his design for an avant-garde publication titled I-10 from 1927. It's considered one of the purest examples of de Stijl principle applied to typography, and it was offensive to printers in its day. In their traditional mindset, they did not understand elements of design that Moholy Nagy would incorporate into his text. Words running vertically, bold sans serif placed into running serif text, bars running vertically beside the page numbers. Maholi Naj was radically reworking the printed page based on a new modernist aesthetic. We'll see more of his design in the next lecture with his move to a small German design school, the Bauhaus.